This is Professor Gavor. I want to present Chapter 7, Production Costs and, and Industry Structure, from our uh, textbooks in microeconomics. <clears throat> and here are the things we want to talk about. Explicit and implicit costs and the difference between accounting and economic profit. Production in a short run, costs in a short run, production in the long run, and then costs in the long run. Um, when we talk about economies of scale, Amazon sells books and other things and ships them directly to the consumer. Until recently, there were no brick-and-mortar Amazon stores. Um, a major reason for their success is their production model and cost structure, which has enabled Amazon to undercut the comp competitors' prices, even when factoring in the shipping costs, because they've basically taken the grocery store, the bookstore, and moved it back a notch and combined the bookstore and the warehouse that would supply the bookstore into one facility. So here's the theory of the firm we're starting to talk about. A firm or producer or business, whatever you want to call it, basically is an organization that, that combines the input of labor, capital, land, raw, or finished component materials to produce outputs or goods or services. Private enterprise, the ownership of the business by private individuals. Uh, production is the process of combining the inputs to produce outputs, ideally of a greater value than the value of the inputs. Um, if I was in class right now, I would hold up the, uh, the device I used to move the slides forward and said probably the, the net total of all the raw material costs uh, for that pointer and slide mover is probably about three or four dollars and probably they sell it for twenty dollars and it's all that extra value they added into those raw materials which are plastics, batteries, maybe an integrated chip, uh, integrated circuit board of some sort. Uh, here's a spectrum of competition. We, uh, we're going to start talking about this for the next several weeks. Uh, we're going to start with perfect com competition which is many firms and an identical product. And then we're going to talk about a monopoly on the other extreme, which is one firm and uh, no similar product. They have a monopoly on the market. They're the only ones that sell it. You have to buy it from them. And then in between, there's two gradations of the move from perfect competition to monopoly. And one is called monopolistic competition. The other one is an oligopoly. And in a monopolistic competition, there's many firms, similar but not identical products. Few firms, identical or similar products. And um, if you look at the examples, uh, perfect competition might include uh, fruits and vegetables, certain kinds of apples, almonds, uh, agricultural products. A monopoly, the monopoly is usually an electricity company, electric company, like Con Ed, uh, Con Ed in, um, in the Chicago land. They're the only provider of electricity. You have to buy it from them. They have a monopoly. Uh, monopolistic competition could be auto companies. They all sell similar products. The Honda Civic, the Toyota Corolla, etc., are similar but not identical. And then maybe the oligopoly is something that's like uh, Apple and uh, uh, Samsung when it comes to smartphones. Again, they're identical or similar products. I don't know if they are identical. You can argue that all day long, but there's just a couple of examples. All right, so explicit and implicit costs and accounting versus economic profit. And we'll give examples of this uh, when I see you next in class, and it'll help drive this home. But profit is basically total revenue minus total cost. Revenue is the income or the sales that comes from selling a product, and total revenue equals price times quantity sold. Explicit costs are out-of-pocket costs, actual payments. They're the wages. They're your fixed costs and variable costs like we did the first week. Then we have implicit costs which are the opportunity costs of using resources that the firm 
already owns. Depreciation of goods, materials, and equipment. And if we look at accounting profit, it's total revenue minus explicit costs. Economic profit, though, is total revenue minus total costs. And total costs is combining the explicit costs and the implicit costs. Accounting profit could actually make money on its own. And this is how accountants would look at it. They look at the business as a whole. But economic profit will ask you, was it a wise move on your part to enter that business? So here's an example. Fred currently works for a corporate law firm. He's opening his own legal practice where he expects to earn $200,000 a year once he gets established. To run his own firm, he needs an office and a law clerk. He's found a perfect office for $50,000 a year and a law clerk that could be hired for thirty five. dollars if these figures are accurate, would Fred's legal practice be profitable? Well, step one, office rental, 50000 law clerk salary. His explicit costs are 85000 There's probably more to it that, than that, but we're simplifying it. Subtracting an explicit cost from the revenue gives you the accounting profit, 200000 minus 85, $115,000. Okay, uh, let's go for it. Um, you're going, to, you're going to show a profit, an accounting profit in your business. And the question is, can he live on that? The economic cost. What if he gave up a $150,000 job to start his own law firm to make $115,000? Now, the economic profit, I'd have to subtract $150,000 from the $115,000, and it would leave him with a $35,000 loss or negative economic profit, which means maybe he was better off staying with his other job, just looking from a pure money standpoint. He might be happier, there might be other factors involved, but we will have more examples of this in class. And of course, you'll have an opportunity to do it in homework. Production in the short run. The factors for production, the inputs, are natural resources, land, and raw materials, labor, capital, technology, and what they call entrepreneurship. The production function is you take the natural resources, you take the labor, you take the K for capital, T for technology, and E for entrepreneurship, put it in some sort of mathematical function, and it comes out with the quantity, how much output a firm can produce with the given inputs. You have fixed inputs, the factors of production that can't easily be increased or decreased in the short term. These are the same things that we called fixed costs in the first week of class. And then you have the variable inputs, factors of production that can easily be increased or decreased in a short period of time. These are your variable costs. And they're using L for that. Usually it stands for labor. K would be the capital costs. So the shorthand form of the production function is just labor and capital or labor materials and capital. Short run. Period of time during which at least some of the factors of production are fixed. Usually the fixed costs. The fixed costs don't change. Long run, the period of time in which all factors are variable. When you talk about accounting, uh, the definition of short term is usually one year and long term is after that. But in economics, it's slightly different. If you don't increase your fixed cost of your factory or your production facility, you're operating in the short term always. As soon as I either add to my factory or uh, sell off part of my factory and reduce my production capacity, now I've entered into the long term because I've changed the fixed cost. I've changed the production equation, that part of the production equation. So production in a short run can be explored through the example of lumberjacks using a two-person saw. Uh, the output is called total product, and it's um, a function of the labor. They just have that one saw. Since K is fixed in a short run, the amount of output trees cut down in a day depends on the amount of labor employed. 
number of lumberjacks working. But if there's only one saw, there's only so much they can do. You could have two-man teams taking, uh, relieving each other. And the fact that they're using that kind of two-man saw, I guess it's things we're still living in 1932 or something where that was the means of cutting down lumber. Now, we're about to make a lot of definitions. Marginal product, the additional output of one more worker. So we look at the change in total production divided by the change in labor. There's a law of diminishing marginal productivity. The general rule is that a firm employs one more labor. Eventually, the amount of additional output, produces, output produced declines. Uh, think about it. We talk about uh, our classroom and maybe having to recarpet it. And it requires taking out the tables and chairs, pulling up the old carpet and tossing it, uh, probably prepping the floor, and then putting down some glue, putting down the tile, the, the carpet tiles. And then, uh, since the carpet tiles probably won't cover the entire floor, cutting carpet tiles to do the edges where the carpet tiles have not reached the walls. One person could probably do it in two days. If it was me, it would probably take three days. But if I had a team of two, I could probably do it in maybe a day and a half. If I had a team of three, I could probably do it in a day. If I had a team of four, I might be able to do it in seven hours. But as soon as I have five, six people hanging around the room, uh, people are going to be in the way of each other, and the, the, the output produced declines. So that's an, uh, an example of marginal product. Short run production function for trees. The top graph shows the, the short run total product for trees. As the number of lumberjacks increase, the output also increases until five lumberjacks are reached, and then it starts to flatten out or decline. The bottom graph shows as the workers are added, the marginal product increases, but as soon as uh, the number increases at first, but as soon or later, the additional workers will have a decreasing marginal product. Uh, the general case, here's the total product curve, and a general case for a marginal product curve. It, it maxes out somewhere. Costs in the short run. Well, you have factor payments. When the firm pays for the use of factors of production, aka the costs, of the firm's perspective. So it's raw and packaging materials, raw material prices, rent, wages, salaries, interests, and dividends, profit. The variable costs are the costs of the variable inputs like labor and materials. The fixed costs are the costs of the fixed inputs like rent. And this really harkens back to the first week again. It's an expenditure that a firm must make before production starts. They do not change in a short run. They do not change regardless of the level of production. And as we said earlier, if you produce nothing, these are the costs you still have to incur. Total cost is a sum of fixed costs and variable costs of production. So fixed costs, expenditure that must be made before production starts and does not change. Variable is the cost of production and increases with the quantity produced. In the short run, fixed costs do not change. The capital invested in land, factory, etc. don't change. Only the variable costs of labor and materials change. So now we define these things. Average variable costs. The variable cost divided by the quantity of output. This is what we call variable costs in the first week. Average fixed cost is the fixed cost divided by the quantity of input. Average total cost would be the total cost divided by the quantity of output. Marginal cost is the cost of producing one more item. When we had the linear cost model where variable cost times quantity plus fixed cost was the equation we looked at, the slope, the variable cost of that linear equation was always your marginal cost. So average total cost is total cost divided by quantity. You could use it as total cost per unit is another way of saying it. Marginal cost is the change in total cost divided by the change in quantity. That will give you how much extra cost it was required to produce it from one level of output to another. 
The average variable cost is the variable cost divided by the quantity of output. All right, here's some math. So we talk about average profit. I, I don't know how it came out that way in these slides, but I, that's why there's no T here. So average profit is profit divided by the quantity produced. Total revenue minus total cost divided by the quantity produced. Total revenue divided by the quantity produced minus total cost divided by the quantity produced. So it's the average revenue minus the average cost or the profit per unit is the revenue per unit minus the cost per unit. Note that average revenue is price times quantity produced divided by quantity produced. So it's just the price. So average profit is the price minus the average cost. So I have for one labor, I can produce, here's a table. Uh, I have units of labor, one through seven. They could be people, they could be hour, man hours, they could be man days, whatever you want to call it. So for one unit of labor, I can produce 16 of these items. My fixed cost is 160. See, it's the short term. The fixed cost does not change. My variable cost is one, for one is 80. For two, it's 160 for labor units, three, two, 40. So four, it's really $80 per labor unit and it keeps multiplying up. And I have my total cost, which goes from the fixed cost and the variable cost added together. So we have a table started that way. At zero production, the fixed costs are, are $160 are still present. You see it happen that way, right? As production increases, the variable costs are added to the fixed costs, and the total cost is the sum of the two. Now we go from labor, quantity, fixed cost, variable cost, total cost. Now we start looking at marginal cost, average total cost and average variable cost. Well, we produced 16 items. We went from zero to 16, and it cost us 240. So if we divide, let me get my calculator here to make sure I can see this. If I divide 240 by 16, Two forty, but divided by sixteen, I get fifteen, not five. I really have to divide my variable cost by sixty. My variable cost is eighty divided by sixteen because I still have to, and that's where I get the five. So eighty divided by sixteen equals five. Forty divided into one sixty will give you three thirty, etc. So you see my marginal cost starting to decrease, but then starting to increase again. My average total cost then is the total cost divided by the quantity produced. And the average variable cost is the variable cost divided by the quantity. So these are different types of costs and looking at the cost per units and the marginal cost. Now, here's some magic stuff. Average total cost is typically U-shaped. So where's my average total cost? Right there. It will be U-shaped. My average variable cost is below the average total cost because and the distance between it and the average total cost will always be the average fixed cost. It's typically U-shaped or maybe sloping upwards. The marginal cost is generally upward sloping. So here's the marginal cost. Now here's where it becomes really magical. And it helps that if we had calculus. Where the marginal cost curve crosses the average variable cost and the average total cost curves are at the minimum of those two curves. Once again, where the marginal cost curve 
crosses the average total cost curve and the average variable cost curve is at the minimum of the average total cost curve and the minimum of the average variable cost curve. That's an important fact that we will need and use later. Average profit or profit margin is the price minus the average cost. If the market price is greater than the average cost, the average pro profit will be positive. This is called margin because the average cost was the variable cost. If the price well, and this is average cost includes fixed cost, so the profit will be positive. If the price is below the average cost, profits will be negative. We will use this fact later, too. So in the long run, all factors are variable. Production function is equal to both labor, the elf, and the capital. Because all factors are variable, the long run production function shows the most efficient way of producing any level of output. The long run is the period of time when costs, all costs are variable. Production technologies, we have alternative methods of combining inputs to produce output. And there's this idea of economy of scale. The this is a situation where as the quantity of output goes up, cost per unit goes down. Think of uh, flat screen TVs that used to cost thousands and thousands of dollars and now because of economies of scale and us improving the production method and the amount of production having gone up astronomically we're able to produce produce a higher quantity of output for a lower cost. Some of that is absorption of the fixed cost. The same thing has happened to LED light bulbs when you think about it. First LED light bulbs were $20 a bulb. Now they cost a couple dollars a light bulb and it's all because of economies of scale. So a small factory produces like S, produces a thousand alarm clocks and an average of $12 per clock. Okay, a medium factory produces 2,000 alarm, alarm clocks at a cost of eight. And a large factory, L, so small, medium, large, produces 5,000 alarm clocks at a cost of $4 a, a clock. Economies of scale exist because larger scale production leads to lower average costs. And it's really the absorption of the fixed costs. So long run average cost curve shows the lowest possible average cost production, cost of production allowing for all inputs to produce all the inputs to production to vary so that the firm is choosing its production technology. The short run average cost curve, the average total cost curve is the short in the short term shows total of the average fixed cost and average variable cost. So I'll look at the long run average cost curve and it also shows at each point there's a short short term average cost curve or a short run average cost curve at every one. So this defines the long term curve. It's always shaped like a bathtub. You have economies of scale and then you have lower production and then this economies of scale kick in. And ranges on the long run average curve. You have constant return to scale when expanding all inputs proportionally does not change the average cost of production. This economies of scale is the cost of producing each individual unit increases as the total output increases. So a firm a factory can grow so large that it becomes difficult to manage efficiently. And I've seen that in my career happen. The shape of the long run average cost curve has implications for how many firms will compete in the industry, whether the firms in the industry will have many different sizes, or if they tend to be the same size. So we will look at um, the long range average cost and the size of number of firms, the long range curve with a clear minimum point here is one thing will reach its production level of R, but a flat bottom long range average cost curve will show between R and S, you could have any variety of positions there where you've achieved your economies of scale. Here's like a unique economy of scale, maybe for one firm with a clear minimum point and a flat bottom one where it shows 
a range of, of economies of scale kicking in. So we've covered both of that. And that's the end of this short lecture. We'll go over all of this again in class and talk about the kind of uh, problems that will be associated with these. Thank you very much for listening.